Hi folks, how's everyone doing? I feel like there's nothing left. This morning has been so powerful. Um, as someone who went to Catholic school her whole life, I feel like this is like a Kairos retreat. This is the best assembly you've ever been to. Um, is there a clicker up here? I don't see it. I don't think it's here. Anyway, but let's have some fun anyway. Um, I was asked to do this um, speaking opportunity uh, maybe nine months ago. Sometimes they contact you so early. And so you spend the whole time thinking, what is there left to say? Like, what can you say to a group of people who are not only immersed in so many thoughtful reflections about who we are in the world, but at a gathering like this, thank you so much, um, at a gathering like this, when you cover so many topics. And so I think since I've been invited to come here, I have been on the lookout of what I wanna talk about and what I wanna share with you. I think sometimes it's hard when you're in an environment where the energy of justice is so strong. And as an individual, you think to yourself, am I as powerful as this entire community? Who am I? Um, you know, tomorrow some of you will go on the, uh, go to Congress and be super aggressive and stand for yourself. And there's some of you who will be so freaked out you can't say a word. And I want us to think about all of the gifts we have to make a difference. Because for every um, amazing speaker like Joanna, for every person who is going to stage that walkout or develop that beautiful protest song, there is the person who, through their quieter gifts, are also part of the process. And so. What I decided to talk about today was something that I saw on Twitter. And unfortunately, most of my best material comes from Twitter, but please forgive me. In April of 2017, Liddell Lee was executed by the state of Arkansas. In the public notice about the state's action against a human being, the prison spokesperson reported that Mr. Lee refused the traditional last meal offered death row inmates and he instead received the sacrament of the Eucharist. The last meal is probably one of the most bizarre rituals of the gruesome practice of the death penalty. In providing a comfort or indulgence before someone is marched to their death, often a reluctant, anxiety-filled, fearful end of life, the public can be distracted from the realities of the conditions of prisons and the brutality of the death penalty with these stories. Sometimes the news will cover requests for lobsters and steaks, buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken, a single olive, or a pot of black coffee. These are ways to talk about inmates receiving too much mercy as they fulfill their sentence, or sometimes they're considered interesting or bizarre fun facts in true crime stories of unrepentant and eccentric serial killers. But in the case of the death sentence delivered to Liddell Lee, and in other situations where the Eucharist was sought before dying, his choice of Holy Communion is perhaps one of the greatest acts of radical hope I have ever heard. His choice of the Eucharist and its interpretation as a refusal of the state's idea of what the last meal should be provides us a powerful way of examining faith in a world that tries to make us see each other and ourselves in our worst ways. Did Mr. Lee actually refuse a last meal? Did he say no to sustenance? Or did his radical hope propel him, as our Catholic tradition has taught us, to receive the most nourishing and most satisfying of last meals? The story of Liddell Lee and the subsequent reports about the malfeasance in his arrest and prosecution, including the possibility he was represented by an intoxicated attorney, stuck me in my gut when I first read about it via the Twitter feed of Sister Helen Prejean, the Catholic nun who has led Catholics to consciousness about not only the death penalty, but also about the racism rooted in the nation's criminal justice system. As someone who had my first communion, I think in second or third grade, I can't remember that far, I'm a lot older than I look, um, and who has taken part in the mass hundreds, if not thousands of times over 30 years, I never understood the radical hope of the Eucharist until Sister Helen shared the story of a man that the state of Arkansas determined so vile and beyond reproach for breaches to the social contract that his extermination was the only response. Mr. Lee did not choose to utter any last words, 
So I may be projecting my own search for radical hope in his decision, but I'm grateful for his gift. In this year, we celebrate the martyrs of El Salvador. As a Catholic young person and teenager, I was told stories of the martyrs of centuries past. But to think of martyrs alive at the same time as me, sharing the same world, real live martyrs whose pictures were in color, like the pictures we took at my first communion, I grew fascinated by people of faith in my own time. Like many Catholic school children in the 1980s and 1990s, we watched the films about the life and death of Jean Donovan, Maura Clark, and now Saint Oscar Romero. Do they still show Romero in school too? Okay, so those things haven't changed. In these dramatic interpretations of martyrdom, the nuns and priests and lay people who served the people of El Salvador emanated grace, and although they struggled in their faith, they were people I imagined worth the admiration given to martyrs. Yet Liddell Lee, someone who will not be considered a martyr, his refusal of his last meal, of his acceptance of the great meal of faith, reignited that same feeling I had as a youth, to think about the, my own refusals and my own spiritual hunger and the choices I have made or refuse to make in the interest of the greater good. So what does it mean for us to believe that our professed faith, the traditions of the church, is the best way to commemorate and honor the end of our own journeys on earth? Our final suppers will be the last taste of what the secular and earthly world has to offer, or will it be the radical hope of the Eucharist? When called to select our last meals, our last suppers, do we imagine our faith being so strong that we refuse the decadence of a lobster, of the artificial sweetness of candy, and simply savor the last taste of our radical hope on earth? I don't know if I could make such a choice or would make such a choice. I don't know if it would occur to me in a moment of fear and hopelessness to turn toward my faith and not away from it. But in reading Lee's story and learning about the various artists who have worked to paint pictures like the ones I'll show you shortly, it gives me a lot to think about. Photographer Henry Hargraves said of this series called No Seconds, it was inspired by the state of Texas's attempt to end the last meal tradition that creating photographs of these meals because he has, quote, always been fascinated by the mix of the mundane and the extraordinary in the most unnatural moment that there is, state-sponsored death. What kind of requests for food have been made? So he recreates these last meals as they would be enjoyed by one of us here today in takeout cartons with proper silverware. And the fact that this is a meal that was enjoyed by someone who had been labeled a criminal and irredeemable on a list along with the details of the meal, Hargreaves forces us to think about what does it mean for us to make mundane these practices of the state? Practices we may disagree with, but uh, that are ultimately done in our names. Ronnie Lee Garner's last meal included his enjoying the Lord of the Rings trilogy before he was put to death before a firing squad a practice that is still legal as a primary or backup method in two other states. The cheery but muted colors of these photographs can convince us that our meals enjoyed in community, around a table with friends, but the details, the small details, like this one of Teresa Lewis's execution, she is among 1% of women who have been killed by the state, reminds us that the photograph and the photographer added the tablecloth and the matching china. Julia Ziegler Haynes has also commemorated people's last meals. She creates sculptures and then takes photographs in a series called Today's Special, and they comprise 24 images of the foods delivered to death row inmates. This request from, 20, uh, from 2007 has been captured by Ziegler Haynes as well as another artist who uses painted pottery to commemorate these meals. Julie Green titled this piece, Pizza and Birthday Cake, shared with 15 family and friends. A prison official said, he told us he had never had a birthday cake 
so we ordered a birthday cake for him. Green also has these pieces in her collection entitled Exonerated for the people who have been able to receive the support necessary to get off death row and enjoy their first meal after learning that their death sentences were voided. I show this to you because we think about our gifts. I'm sure there are many talented artists here who in their contribution to this question of justice can bring people closer to a set of ideas in ways that great speeches and great campaigns can also do. So I remind us always to focus on the ways that we can use these gifts to interpret the urgency of the issues that are important to us. As a historian of fast food and a member of an organization that tries to approach the problem of hunger with a somewhat radical approach, do we have any people from Campus Kitchens? Yay, good to hear. Um, I've been thinking a lot about who we are and what we consume. I'm thinking about the choices we savor at the end, not only of our lives, but the end of the milestones of our lives. What do we care to remember, to savor, to choose at our time in high school, in college? During your next visit home to see family and friends, what will you take back from that moment? And since we are here as a solidarity network, what do we imagine our last acts of justice will be at the end of our days? Before we go to sleep each night, when we examine how we spent our time, what will be our last act as people in solidarity with those who struggle, as people in struggle with those who suffer, and as people who choose radical hope? One of the great privileges and burdens many of us face is that of choice. We have so many choices. We can choose what we learn about, what we resist. We choose our relationships, how we spend our time. We choose and we choose and we choose. And we bask in our options and we're overwhelmed by them. And we still have to choose. And there are some choices that our world makes us believe can't be made, can't be logical and can't be real. We live in a world that says we have no choice but to segregate our schools. We have no choice to ignore the marginalized, no choice but to pursue what is financially rich rather than morally resplendent. That we have no choice to be merciful at the expense of someone else's misery. Most, if not all of us here, will never have to make the choice Liddell Lee made. But thinking about every day, we have the capacity to decline the empty fuel of the world for the true nourishment of our spiritual and social conviction. So over the past few years, I've been a lot of places. I've been on the road about 30 to 40 times a year, spending time at Catholic schools like the ones I attended, churches like the ones I experienced my sacraments, community groups that nurture the radical hope of their members, and college campuses filled with earnest, justice-loving students like yourselves. And I teach many wonderful students like Joanna at Georgetown University. And Every place I go, people are concerned about the same things. The pervasive issues that concern people of faith and people of conscience, racism in our schools, police brutality and misconduct, the terrifying consequences of the 2016 election, and the pervasive legacy of slavery in the US, especially at universities like the one I work at and among Catholic communities. I've discovered that at every place I go, people are struggling with various levels of feeling powerless. When they are advantaged by their gender, their race, their educational background, their faith, and their wealth. People who are descendants of the enslaved have few avenues to fully articulate the pain of generations that has become part of their own pain. The descendants of slaveholders, including many American Catholics, are connected to the people who cause so much pain, and they sometimes are forced to confront the fact that their power is indeed empty and they know that confronting the roots of it would alienate them from their own families and communities. How do we make these choices? What can we choose? I think about the choices put in front of all of us who seek to do justice, and we seek mercy for ourselves and others. As a historian, I often take to my books for the great heroes of moments past for inspiration. I read about the radical response of Rosa Parks to the epidemic of sexual violence in the South that terrified black women and girls. 
I sometimes log into YouTube, this is like the only good thing on YouTube, and listen to the great speeches of Martin Luther King Jr., who's dying his short life, understood that he may be indulging in his very last meal because his crusade for justice was always met with threats of violence. I listen to the music of Nina Simone and deliberate on her desperate hope when she sang, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I have to admit, and I, I think my mom is looking at this at live stream, she might not, um, but I never look at the Bible. <laughs> the Bible is usually last on the list of texts um, that I look to for inspiration. But over the years, after hearing testimony after testimony about the struggle to do what is right, or even know what is right, I have found myself turning to scripture and the life of Jesus, who many of us have been taught was the greatest radical hoper of his time. Jesus' example helps, helps us understand not just love in action, but the radical refusal to say no to the idea that injustice, cruelty, and desertion are just consequences of life. In talking to groups about the legacies and the afterlives of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, and racial terror in our lives, I often recall the story of the New Testament, when Jesus is in the depths of his hunger, his exhaustion, in his preparation for his march towards a death penalty of swords, towards state-sanctioned death. So the devil presents himself in front of Jesus with a series of tests of faith. After 40 days and nights of fasting, the devil demands that Jesus turn stones into bread. He refuses. He directs Jesus to throw himself off a high point to test his faith in God. Jesus refuses. Then the most relatable of all moments in the scripture happens to Jesus. Matthew tells us, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Upon that point about the great kingdoms, the devil asks Jesus to renounce God, your creator, the peace and love of the world, for not only earthly wishes, but also for the fantasy that there are no choices, but inevitable arrangements that lead to and fuel empty power. The choice to renounce, the choice to say no to the devil's bargains, to renounce racism in favor of love, to renounce sexism and homophobia in order to choose radical acceptance, to renounce the empty wealth of seeking money and power instead of the wealth of the spirit, we are forced to make these choices every day and who we say hello to and where we avert our eyes and who we welcome at our tables and who we repel and what we purchase and what we abstain from consuming. The devil and what the devil represents in this story is not the character of movies that haunt our houses and keep our imaginations up all night. We fear the devil as it's presented to us in popular culture. I am not a theological expert, nor do I proclaim to be, so I cannot confirm or deny the existence of the devil, like in the movies. But over the years, hearing from people whose families have grieved the loss of loved ones at the hands of the state, of racists, of intimate partners, of indifferent strangers, people who have been stripped of their humanity in the search for relief across borders, I've discovered that what Jesus encountered in the wilderness and what was called Satan is a more frightening presence than any silver screen devil. The antithesis of Jesus's commitment to love and wholeness are the devil's manifestations in our time. And it's strangely soothing and easy. It comes, in alive of the, it comes alive in the quiet work of keeping kids away from clean drinking water in Flint. It keeps homes full of lead in Baltimore and drives the price of affordable housing outside the reach of working people in DC. It muffles the cries of the terrorism at our nation's borders, and it mutes the cries that accompany the process of eating one's own last meal delivered on death row. As Jesus confronts, all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. We are offered that each and every day in our lives. And our potential to radically refuse these small bargains is the beginning of how we rebuild our radical hope. We can get scared. We are sometimes rejected for doing what is right, persecuted for being different. So with a clear vision of the world we wish to see 
and a heart afraid of a world alone, we flinch. We choose a secure path. In my years talking to students and educators alike about confronting bias, racism, and other forms of hate, I try to understand how these forms of hatred have their own comforts. Like Jesus' temptation in the desert, Satan, our society's cruelties, are not unattractive or uncomfortable. Rather, they are deeply attractive. They allow us to be in community sometimes with our families, our friends, our schoolmates, our churches, and our political parties. If racism or ignoring poverty is the price you have to pay, then why not? Belonging is a fundamentally human impulse, yet we preserve our humanity in our capacity to find more spiritually nutritious sources of life. Radical hope isn't just about what we desire, what we hope for without limits. Radical hope is also about what we choose in order to honor our hope and the hope of others. Thank you.